views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. For tonight, we had scheduled a political debate between the candidates running for city council and the general election in the 13th Council District, which includes the Bronx neighborhoods of City Island, Morris Park, Allerton, and Throgs Neck. Liberal Party candidate John Doyle said he would not be pursuing his campaign. Working Families Party candidate Marjorie Velasquez did not respond, respond to any phone calls, texts, or emails. And Republican Party candidate John Serini informed us as late as Friday at 5.10 p.m. that he was, quote, not able to move a family commitment, unquote. So BronxNet offered Mr. Serini two alternative times to record the program and then also suggested the possibility of switching the entire program to next Monday, but he said he's not available. And so Democratic candidate Mark Jonai is here with us, and so is New Bronx Party candidate Alex Gomez. They're here to talk about the future of the 13th City Council District, and uh, we will tell you tonight's program is sponsored by the League of Women's Voters, a nonpartisan political organization that advocates for informed and active participation in government and works to increase understanding of major public policy issues. For your information, the general election is Tuesday, the 7th of November, and we and they encourage all eligible voters to get out and vote. So, welcome to Democratic Party candidate Mark Joni. Nice to have you with us, sir. Good to see you, Gary. Thank you for having and me And also to New Bronx Party candidate Alex Gomez. Mr. Gomez, nice to have you with us. Thank you for having uh, me. Mr. Joni, let's uh, just start with a general thing. Let's do good and bad. What, what is good in the 13th Council District that you like to boast about? And then what are maybe top three things that you look at that you think need correction? Well, certainly 13 Council and District. And we'll get Mr. Gomez to answer the same question in a moment. 13 Council District has a strong middle class home, home ownership base. Um, it also has unique neighborhoods which sets us apart from the rest of the city. We have the neighborhoods of Alton Avenue, Pelham Parkway, Morris Park, Pelham Bay, Throgs Neck, City Island. And we're all proud of these neighborhoods and those residents that live there certainly are proud of the areas that they live in. Um, we talk about the needs of the uh, 13 council district. Uh, it varies from neighborhood to neighborhood. There are different needs, but overwhelmingly, everybody wants to feel safer where they live. They want to make sure that they have a better educational system in the future for their children. They want to make sure that the health care system is there to adequately meet their needs and obviously the development scenarios. So it's about quality of life. It's about infrastructure. It's about making sure that we live in a safer, better, community. Uh, your thoughts on the same question? Yes, uh, I've lived there for the last 10 years and my wife grew up over the last 30 plus years in the neighborhood. Uh, the 13th Council District over the last 15, 20 years has changed dramatically. It's a thriving neighborhood, uh, middle class, definitely um, some development, uh, but there are some problems in the area, in some parts of the uh, district where there's overdevelopment and I think that that's one of the issues that I would like to address uh, if elected to City Council. Uh, what do you mean by overdevelopment? And maybe you can define mm -hmm. that and explain it so that people uh, will understand maybe the difference between development, good development, right. and overdevelopment. Well, oh, development needs to be uh, proactive. Uh, there should be an involvement of the community. Uh, there should be an involvement of the people that live in those neighborhoods. Uh, some of the development has caused no parking to be uh, available. Um, even on my block alone, uh, I, I remember 10 years ago I could park anywhere. Now it's it, you. You go in circles looking for parking late at night if you don't have parking in front of your house. Too crowded. It's too crowded, and then you also have uh, more people in in a condensed or dense area. Uh, so you have buildings where there were houses before, 
and and that's not good because these neighborhoods were mostly residential with houses one and two family homes mm -hmm. um uh, Mr. Jonai, you uh, have made a, a, a big point uh, in the campaign, through the primary campaign, and even up till today, uh, talking about uh, fair share. You even introduced a lawsuit to the city of New York, uh, suing them, saying that the Bronx is uh, are carrying an unfair burden as far as uh, supportive facilities and those kinds of things. Um, talk to me about why you issued that lawsuit in conjunction with other community members. Um, and what do you think its realistic prospects of a uh, passage are? And frankly, many people said, you know what, here he is in the middle of a campaign, so he introduces a lawsuit, he puts his name in the paper. You know, w was it because of that? Well, I want to make sure I clarify something. It's never just about the campaign. I truly care and am passionate about this borough that I was born in. Uh, early on, after I got elected into the assembly, I met with the commissioner and discussed the inundation that we felt was happening in the borough of the Bronx, and not much has changed. A fair share plan that just came out in 2017, February, uh, by the city, illustrated exactly what we all knew, and nothing has changed for the better. It's only been for the worse when it comes to the borough of the Bronx. We have twice as much per capita than Queens. 41% more than Brooklyn, 13% more than Manhattan, and 99% more than Staten Island. This is overburdening of, the of system, supportive, supportive housing units. Right. This is an overburden of our educational system. It's an overburden of our health care system. It's an overburden on our police department. And it's taking affordable housing units off the market that can go to Bronx sites that are now being given to these families that may be coming from all parts of the city, the state, and throughout the country and finding their way into the borough of the Bronx. You, you like the idea of what he did? You have a difference of opinion? What's your thought well, on that? I, I agree uh, that we need to um, bring a lawsuit to the city and that there should be a fair share across the, across the board. The problem is is that uh, the other five or the other four boroughs have already built or have used up all the land that they had available. Um, and Mayor de Blasio, uh, along with a lot of these developers that he made deals with, um, have started to look for places to build up and the Bronx is probably the last land that's available, um, and that's number problem number one. Problem number two is that although um, Mr. Jonai brought up this lawsuit, um, I think it's going to be a challenge for the city to change its policies um, unless we actually have people in the city council that will stand up and, and speak up and, and create policy that will stop uh, future development from happening without the consent and without the uh, voice of the people in the community. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons, and, and we'll start with you then and then we'll go to you, one of the mm -hmm. reasons that um, it's claimed that mm -hmm. uh, the Bronx is getting many of these facilities is because the city, and I think it's a correct idea, wants people who are without homes, who have lost their homes, uh, to be in the neighborhoods where they grew up or where they've been living. And so if they've been living in a neighborhood, they would rather have the facility, frankly, built in that same neighborhood rather than have them living in, in Queens or Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And then those kids would have to be bused to schools. You have families, you know, really, really displaced. Um, what, what's your response to that uh, when, you know, to you is it's unfortunate, but, you know, many of these people do come from the Bronx? Uh, well, ideally, that's the best scenario, uh, if we can keep people close to where they grew up or where they call home. Um, but that's not always the case. I've worked in the last five years for a supportive housing program or for a non-for-profit that does supportive housing in the Bronx, um, in the South Bronx specifically. And, and when I've interviewed some of these candidates uh, or applicants who are coming in, uh, they always say that they would prefer to live in Queens or Brooklyn or Manhattan, but this was the only option they had because a lot of those other units or apartments where they wanted to live are not available. So yes, I, I believe in what the mayor is saying, but that's not exactly what's happening um, in New York City, specifically here in the Bronx. I think, like I said before, a lot of the housing that is available is, is, is very limited and it's mostly in the Bronx. So your thoughts I, on the same question? I really want to comment on this. It's simple. The reason why we have this inundation in the borough of the Bronx is because land in the borough of the Bronx is much, much cheaper than the rest of the city. Developers are getting the same income regardless of where they build these housing units in the city. Well, if you're a build developer and you're going to get the same income no matter where you build in the city, what are the factors that are going to make a decision on where you invest? When you have cheaper land prices, and construction costs are cheaper 
in the borough, the Bronx, and the rest of the city, it's a simple decision for them to make. And that's part of the problem. We need to come up with a constructive way to make sure that these affordable housing units are built and this responsibility, which we have, is shared by the entire city. All five boroughs must do their part under, under this administration. We must make sure that those boroughs that are dealing with these needy families, these decent families that are just homeless or they need additional services, get the services to meet the needs of these family members. Some of the plaintiffs in that lawsuit uh, were very clear that, you know what, this whole program is wrong, that instead of building this kind of housing, just build affordable housing, costs you the same thing, the city ought to do that. You like that idea? I certainly do because we need long-term ownership, uh, so home Mr. ownership. You, <laughs> what, what we need is to place these families in permanent housing not temporary. It doesn't do the family any good. It doesn't do the children good. It doesn't do the community good. It doesn't do the schools any good that you have the burden of dealing with these families that certainly have come with special needs or the health care systems. Uh, let right. me, let's I, let you I, I think it that it, well. it's correct. We do need to build permanent housing for a lot of these individuals and families, but the problem is that they're using the wrong math uh, to come up with the rents. Um, that they do, and it's not really affordable. Uh, so they call it affordable housing, but affordable for, for who? who exactly? Is it affordable for the new people moving into the neighborhood, or is it affordable for the people that already live there, like you said, that they would like to remain in the neighborhood? And it's not happening. Um, I, like I said, I live uh, in, in Throgs Neck, but I work in the South Bronx right now, and the rent for a studio apartment in the building that I run in the South Bronx is 1300 mm. None of my clients, if they had to work full-time and pay that amount would be af able to afford that. And it's a shame. I mean, although Mr. John I said that the, the, the developers want to get the same, they get the same rent everywhere. And yes, they do get the rent, the same rent, but the prices or the medium average that they use in order to determine the prices of this housing is not the, the medium average household income in that particular neighborhood. And, and we, I should just add that the $1,300 you're talking about, that's for a studio. A studio. So if they have a, a family, which of course right. many people do. I want to change the topic a little bit, an iconic part of our borough which characterizes the personality of our borough, the diversity of our borough, is City Island. Mm -hmm. There are issues on uh, uh, trying to preserve the mm -hmm. downtown of City Island, preserve the nautical industry. There are obviously transportation issues getting in and out of the island, uh, island uh, despite the fact that we're, the new bridge is about to be, uh, uh, the ribbon's going right. to be cut uh, very shortly. Um, talk to me about City Island. If you're elected to the City Council, what do you do to help build City Island up to, to really what I think we all want to see? It well, become? it should be. I mean, it should be a place where people want to go on the weekends, on, on a weekday. And at any time, um, there's, there's great entertainment. There's also a lot of shops and, and small restaurants that deserve the, the opportunity to, to be able to see a bigger audience or a bigger crowd. I mean, it's already crowded sometimes if you try to get there by car. you got um, to so be a Bronx to, person so who knows when and when, when not to go. <laughs> but I would, <laughs> I would suggest a ferry, uh, a ferry stop along the way, which hasn't happened yet. One not only in, in City Island, but one in Throgs Neck. Um, which now the city has a ferry system uh, in Brooklyn and Manhattan, and they said that they're going to put one in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, and in Hunts Point. Um, but we need one in City Island. We need one in Frog's Neck. Something else is a Metro North Stop. Why can't we build a Metro North Stop close to City Island? Um, that way it can alleviate some of that uh, car traffic mm -hmm. as well. So those are, those are some of my ideas, as, as well pro as proposed uh, more transit, because there's not enough buses that uh, go throughout the day and night to City Island. Uh, let's keep it going on transportation. You did put out something about ferry service, right? That's uh, one of your ideas. I certainly did, but let's of. talk first about City Island, the uniqueness and okay. the beauty of that community, which I had the pleasure uh, of living there for 14 years. Both of my boys were born on City Island, so City Island's home for me, and I have a soft spot for City Island. Plague with vacant stores. We have to fill those stores with uh, the type of stores that would complement the community in itself. Uh, we have not only restaurants there, but it truly is a destination place for artists, and they have arts and crafts that truly add to the uniqueness and beauty of this island. I don't think it's in the best interest of City Island that we bring a ferry there. We already have enough traffic um, and visitors for the island. We don't need to add to it. Certainly, we can come up with more creative ways that will be less expensive for those that want to frequent City Island, and that can be through a trolley. Uh, we can have a meet at Orchard Beach or around the circle uh, going into Rodman's Neck. There's adequate parking at both sections, and we can have a trolley that would alleviate the congestion of cars. 
Uh, that would be an easy fix. As far as the ferry service, last week I had the uh, pleasure, and I say pleasure uh, with the uh, in quotations, of uh, testifying before the city council in fighting for ferry service for the borough of the Bronx. Uh, we truly have a desert transportation hub in the Throgs Neck section, and our options are very limited. That ferry would be an immediate fix to a infrastructure that's not in place. Our roadways cannot meet the demand of traffic, and during peak traffic times, our buses are traveling at five miles per hour. So to get to Manhattan, you take the bus to the train, uh, the car to the bus, the bus to the train type of mentality where we can easily set one up at Ferry Point Park, Throgs Neck section. We have the land. There's, it's readily available. Uh, ferry Point Park, and hence its name itself warrants a ferry, uh, would be an adequate <laughs> location uh, for the ferry. For the ferry. Uh, we did an interview on this show with the uh, representative of the AAA, and he told me a statistic, which I still think of, and he said, this is the only number you need to know. The last five years in the city of New York, we've added 125,000 cars. And he said, mm -hmm. that may not li sound like a lot, but end to end, or you put them out there when everybody's traveling in rush hour in the morning, in the afternoon, after school, and that's why uh, we, we were talking, uh, mm -hmm. you got stuck in traffic on Pelham Parkway. We're always stuck on traffic in Pelham Parkway, and it's only one spot. Um, what alternatives, I mean, is ferry the only alternative? Is there another way of looking for at infrastructure of roads? I mean, certainly I realize the bridge uh, construction is now alleviated, but that part of the Bronx has had it up to here with uh, traffic from the bridges. So we'll start with you and we'll give you a chance to weigh in on that. Certainly we've taken some initiatives. They may be the wrong initiatives for certain neighborhoods. Between bike lanes, bus lanes, and these narrower roadways, that create more traffic are not a solution. They're creating a bigger problem for us. Uh, so uh, with the expansion of roadways, whether it be the Hutch or our local streets in East Tremont, um, and more bus service that will take us to destination places. Why would you want to sit in a bus mm -hmm. moving five miles an hour when you can walk just as fast? Uh, you know, <laughs> we have to be practical to these approaches. And although well-intended, uh, bus lanes, bike lanes, are creating a bigger problem for us than they are resolving the issue at hand. So alternative transportation methods such as ferry service is a quick fix and a, relatively speaking an inexpensive way of meeting demand. We have, they just invested $4.4 billion for the Second Avenue train stop. An additional $2.4 billion is going into the Queens, Brooklyn uh, trolley. We I can know what's coming, you going to tell me, could I take, get a piece of that in the Bronx, uh, right, for well, infrastructure? Why not? Right. And a ferry would be a fraction of that cost, and it can be done overnight and quickly. Uh, your, your thought on, on, that, on that horrible number of 125,000 new cars in five right. years? No, I, I completely agree. I, I think that um, we do have a quick solution by putting a ferry uh, not only in, in, in Throgs Neck, but also in City Island. But I, I, I wouldn't put the actual ferry stop in Ferry Point. I would put it on the other side, closer to the houses, closer to where people live. Uh, that street next to um, to Ferry Point, to get to Ferry Point is always crowded with traffic going into the Whitestone Bridge. Mm -hmm. So that's another problem. Even though now they took away the uh, toll plazas, it, there's so much traffic on both the Throgs Neck and also the uh, Whitestone Bridge. But I think long term, we can add a Metro no North stop in, in somewhere along the district close enough to Throgs Neck, I think that that's definitely a plus. Will that be a five-year or a ten-year plan? I, I, I think so. But obviously there are some short-term solutions that can be presented quickly and solved, such as the ferry point um, a park or ferry to Throgs Neck. Uh, changing gears, uh, Mr. Gomez, um, all over the Bronx mm -hmm. and, and literally all over the country, um, people are up in arms about the opioid uh, issue Correct. and there are uh, uh, needles found literally everywhere, maybe in neighborhoods that didn't used to see them. Uh, uh, I've heard from people on City Island, I've heard from people in Morris Park, uh, that this is becoming a growing problem. Uh, it is multi-tiered in terms of why it's happening, uh, but if you are elected to the City Council, mm -hmm. how do you look at that and how do you address it? You can't turn away because People are dying, and th there's costs in just about every direction you turn. Well, th it's definitely a cause that I can speak uh, to from because I work with clients who have uh, been affected by this epidemic um, on a daily basis. So some of the clients that I serve now in my professional uh, job, day job, are working with individuals who are formerly homeless and formal, formal addicts or individuals who are still recovering because you can never say that they're fully recovered. 
Um, so I, I see it. Uh, I, I have experienced it firsthand. I've trained all my staff to deal with someone um, who, who might be having an overdose. I, w I also have trained my family and I would definitely train my community. So it's something that I would push um, a citywide that people should get training, should be, uh, understand training, it. Is that, that well, that's one of them, training, yeah. uh, and, and actually put it out there so that people know and are aware. Awareness is, is also important, how to see it coming before it happens, um, and, and, and work with families that uh, I think need the support because it's not just affecting the individual, it's affecting the mother, the father, the sister, the brother. Yeah, it's and, and those the whole community. So, though, yeah, so we, we, we definitely, and also police. We need to train our police force to respond to it uh, so that they can help uh, alleviate the problem. So we have to add more uh, foot, foot traffic as far as foot patrol and try to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I'll add one more uh, ingredient into the question to uh, Mr. Jonai. We hear from many people that, you know what, we got, where are the police? Why aren't the police handling this? Is the, the security aspect of it, is the policing aspect of it something that you look at? First of all, this is a true epidemic, and it's facing, I don't care about your background, your wherewithal, your financial status. I don't care about your religion or your gender or your ethnicity. It's impacting all families, and I would be, it would be difficult for me to find anyone out there in this community that doesn't know someone, if not have a family member or a friend of a family member that has overdosed. So this is at epidemic proportions. And we have to do it, it has to be an attack on two ways. Keep in mind, this is a $500 billion business. Mm -hmm. $500 billion that has completely infiltrated every aspect of our daily lives because unfortunately medication is our only treatment and we're becoming dependent upon them. But we need, I'm a big fan of scared straight. Let's educate the next generation to prevent them from experimenting. And these are household products. These aren't, you know, difficult that you have to buy them on a street corner. These opioids are being found in our homes. Yes, in it, grandma's it's gone from a dialogue about had, heroin to a dialogue about opioids, uh, which includes so much more. Right, found in uh, grandma's medicine cabinet and it's found in mom's pocketbook. Everyone has them in their homes. That's problem number one. Problem number two, certainly dealing with those that need treatment. Make sure that we start them on the reform sooner than later. Uh, and going back to policing, as you mentioned, going after the drug dealers. We need a three-prong attack. Mm -hmm. Educating before they start, scared straight. Let's begin with kids as young as 12 are overdosing on drugs today. Let's begin that early on educating them of the importance of not starting. Let's challenge the epidemic by giving treatment to all those that are suffering from this illness. And then thirdly, make sure that the police are actually, go, law enforcement goes after those that are supplying these drugs. Um, Mr. Joan, I, uh, just changing gears again, uh, let's talk uh, politics a little bit. You have been rather outspoken about uh, Mayor de Blasio. You're, you're not totally in love with this mayor, apparently. Uh, would you be concerned uh, that if, um, uh, you know, uh, people agree with you, then a Republican mayor would take hold and then some of the values that people of the Bronx feel strongly about, whether it be immigration, uh, whether it be health care, something that you talked about earlier, uh, you know, um, uh, whether it be uh, the environment, all those kinds of things uh, would uh, suffer at the result of having a Republican mayor. Well, first of all, let's set something straight. It's not that I'm opposed to the mayor. When he does something that is good, I compliment him. But in this case, and in many cases, when it involves the borough of the Bronx, we have the tale of two boroughs. And it begins with, one, support of housing. Two, it begins with transportation. Three, it begins with education. The schools, how many, dis how many schools in this district still have trailers creating a second-class student? Tale of two mm -hmm. students. It continues with the park maintenance that we don't have and the investment that we need. So when my arguments are s simple, give us the resources that we're entitled to, just like the rest of the city. Either we're a part of the city or we're not, and if so, give us the tools that we need to make sure that we enjoy our quality of life, make sure that our students are safer and we have the same options as anyone else in the city. The follow-up, the obvious follow-up, are you going to vote for him again? Or vote for him to... I met with him not too long ago, and I endorsed him during the summer, and that was because of his pledge to the borough of the Bronx that he would give us the resources that we need. And I'll still hold on to hold that. Hold on to that. 
uh, your thought on that question, and that, that's probably going to be the final, uh, you get the final word of the, of the evening. Well, uh, like Mr. Jolay said, he, he endorsed uh, de Blasio. I, I definitely opposed Mr. de Blasio. Um, I wouldn't want a Republican uh, mayor in, in the city. I think we, we do need to get a Reform Party candidate, possibly Sal, um, and that's my bid for Sal. Uh, but um, Sal Albanese is who you're referring to. Correct. And, and so, I, so if, I, if you didn't support uh, the incumbent, you're saying don't vote for the Republican, but you would vote for the Reform correct. Party. Correct. Correct. And, and and I don't say it because it's the Reform Party, but I believe in what the platform that Sal um, has put together, and and he's definitely has the experience uh, at city in the city council, and he's an attorney. He he knows he knows the law, he knows the city, and he knows what needs to get done. But as far as um, Mr. De Blasio, I would definitely speak up and be uh, someone who he wouldn't like too much at the council. So, <laughs> All right, listen, uh, gentlemen, I, I want to thank you both uh, for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, there were others who didn't, and uh, you made it here, and uh, you thought it was important to speak to the people of the Bronx. And uh, we certainly hope, uh, win, lose, or draw, that uh, you will both uh, make a habit of coming back to Bronx Talk as often as you can. Certainly. Thank you. Mark thank Joni, you. thank you. Alex thank Gomez, you. thank you. And uh, folks, if you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on the show tonight or anything going on in the Bronx, send us an email at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org, or you can send us a tweet at Bronx Talk or post them on our Facebook page, and we'll read them on the air during a future edition of our program. You can check out our archives at bronxnet.org. you find Bronx Talk by following the watch menu on the new Bronxnet website. Next week, more politics, more election stuff, but with a different twist. We'll take a look at both sides of the con-con issue, that is, Constitutional Convention. We'll have a yes and a no, and you'll get a lot of information out of that. Thank you to our producer, Lindsay Violet, our director, William Guzman, the cast of thousands who were here. To them, to you, we'll see you next week. Good night. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund Reading. Why do you not get me? I do. This is what it feels like for kids with learning and attention issues. Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive. You made your house a reality. Homeschooling yourself on loans, color coding listings, and flushing every toilet in a 20 mile radius. If you can ace house hunting, you can do it for retirement. Get on track with tips at aceyourretirement.org.